Thank you very much, Joachim, for the, the introduction. Thank you, the U UBS Center, for the invitation. Thank you all uh, for, for being here. Uh, it, it has been a, a fascinating day, uh, and those of you who've been here the, all day uh, um, have been in for, for a treat uh, of very diverse uh, perspectives on, on this issue. Um, uh, I think Joachim's introduction um, already set the, set the stage for uh, what I'm going to be uh, talking about, uh, largely around the, uh, these issues of, of the, the political trilemma of the world economy, which um, uh, I uh, first wrote about uh, back in 2000, I think was, it was published um, in a, for an article in the uh, uh, Journal of Economic Perspectives, and, and a number of authors were asked to, to sort of speculate, since this was a, a kind of a millennium issue, to speculate very widely about the future of economics. And uh, at the time, to be perfectly honest, I had no idea that this framework uh, would be at all uh, um, insightful or useful. Um, it was a highly speculative piece, uh, but uh, over time, and I have to say sadly, um, I, uh, you know, it, it helped me understand many things that were, uh, that were going on in the world economy, and, and, and that's, uh, that's the kind of perspective I'm going to try to give you uh, this afternoon. Um, if there is one thing that, that uh, beyond the trilemma that I, you know, I would like you to take away from this talk, um, is not to think about globalization as just one thing. Uh, globalization is something that we design. Um, it's our rules that, um, des that, that uh, make globalization. And what that means is that there can be many, many different types of globalization, um, and, um, uh, and therefore that the real debate about globalization shouldn't be, um, do we want more globalization, do we want less, are we more globalizing, are we deglobalizing? Uh, those might be interesting questions, but I think as we, we sort of go forward, the real question that I see is uh, what kind of globalization, what are the rules, uh, who should be sitting around the table, whose interests should be privileged, and what does that mean uh, for the diverse policies of different, different kinds of, of, of countries? Um, I think um, many of our problems are rooted in a particular kind of globalization uh, that we have been striving for um, since maybe the 1980s or the early 1990s. And I will call this form of globalization hyper-globalization uh, to distinguish it both from, um, uh, to distinguish it from an earlier uh, kind of globalization that, that, uh, we, that, that we had under the, during the Bretton Woods era. And I think the main distinguishing feature of hyper-globalization is, is that, that it's an attempt to uh, really get rid of all the transaction costs associated with the national borders. And that's simply not just tariffs and quotas at the border, but it's also anything else, all the domestic regulations, standards, uh, rules on uh, product safety or intellectual property or banking regulations uh, that uh, can uh, uh, act as a, as a transaction cost, the free movement of, uh, of goods, services, uh, capital, finance, and, and, and so forth. Um, and, and, uh, and, and this conception of globalization has been actually taken uh, to its most extreme form within uh, the Eurozone, uh, where it's not just the four freedoms plus uh, monetary unification, it's, it's the sort of the, the real world counterpart, if you will, uh, of hyper-globalization in a regional setting. That's what the Eurozone is, and I will relate my trilemma to the Eurozone as well. Um, I will argue that that kind of hyper-globalization, which essentially um, uh, uh, makes integration of markets pretty much an end for itself, and there's uh, some logic to it because you get the, the gains from trade. Uh, you get the benefits of larger markets, and as an economist, uh, um, I know as well as any other economist, the value of comparative advantage and the gains from trade and the benefits of the division of labor, and certainly the logic behind that process of trying to push for hyper-globalization uh, is to reap those economic gains. Um, but I'm going to argue that that vision of hyper-globalization uh, runs into very severe uh, problems in practice that the, that the trilemma uh, tries to highlight. And I think uh, looking at it from that perspective, it forces us to take a, to, to take a step back 
and ultimately my conclusion uh, that in order to have a uh, fairer, more sustainable, better globalization, uh, in fact, we need to revert back uh, to a somewhat earlier conception of globalization that doesn't push for hyper-globalization, and, and paradoxically, that actually makes globalization safer and so more sounder and more sustainable. Um, so that's, um, that's the overall uh, uh, framework. Uh, but let me start uh, with um, populism. Uh, two things that I think we need to be clear about uh, populism. One, I think, is, is already clear, and, and that's because everybody's talking about populism, because it's actually, it's become a global phenomenon. Uh, it's not just uh, Brexit, it's not just Trump, uh, it's, uh, of course, the rise of populist parties in, in, in Europe. So it's, it's really a global phenomenon. So it has to be associated with some global trend. Um, the second thing uh, about, about populism, which uh, this chart um, uh, it, it, it signifies is that it's, it just didn't happen in 2016 that, that the populist parties have been gaining uh, electoral strength for quite some time now. So this is actually, this is now a, a process that has been ongoing. It's not from one day to the next. So it's, it has to be, therefore populism has to be related to something that has been going on for quite some time. Now, um, when we look at the history of, of, of globalization, uh, it's actually there's a fairly clear link between the rise and fall of uh, globalization and the rise and fall of various kinds of populist uh, uh, reactions to globalization. Um, earlier, Kevin O'Rourke uh, sort of mentioned many of these links and, and, and talked specifically about these various turning points. Um, it's worth pointing out that the very first self-consciously populist movement uh, in world history, uh, even, going be, you know, even going before sort of Latin American populism, Peron and, and, and all that, was an American uh, populist movement uh, of the late 19th century. It was an alliance of uh, farmers and silver miners. And what was the primary grievance of the American populists? Uh, it was uh, essentially the gold standard. It was the sense that the gold standard made uh, credit, uh, uh, you know, credit expensive, uh, real interest rates very high, um, and uh, the, um, the 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 populists at the time blamed uh, the New York financiers, the New York elite. Uh, for being essentially behind the gold standard and making their life um, uh, so, uh, so difficult. Um, but it was the very first uh, self-conscious populist movement in history was decidedly took a position uh, against uh, the globalization of that time, um, the, the, the gold standard. Now, uh, the, the, the populist of the uh, 1890s in the United States essentially uh, withered away, largely because uh, there were lots of gold discoveries in South Africa. You know, the price of gold uh, went down, so you know, there was an inflationary environment. So the kind of immediate economic economic grievances uh, that had mobilized uh, populism at the time uh, dissipated and, and the populists didn't get anywhere uh, politically, but of course uh, these kinds of populist reactions um, uh, uh, came back and of course in the interwar period we had two extreme populist reactions to the failures of the gold economy, one on the extreme right with Nazism and fascism, the other uh, on the extreme left with the rise of communism. Each had their issues with the um, uh, world economy. One was a reassertion of cultural autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the uh, uh, world economy. Uh, the other was the reassertion of social rights or workers' rights. Um, and now, of course, we're back uh, to a kind of, of a, um, another um, uh, sort of zenith in, 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 in globalization and um, a, also a, a populist uh, reaction. So I want to I talk about um, three things, and, and, and I'll need to go through these rather quickly. I just want to talk briefly about the trilemma. Uh, then talk about the application of the trilemma to Europe, the European Union, the Eurozone, and then uh, conclude with, with some ideas about sort of my conception of, of my ideas about how we could think about a fairer globalization. So here is the, here is the, the trilemma. Uh, the trilemma says uh, 
in sort of, you know, we economists like to always present things as a trade-off. This is, if you will, it's an augmented trade-off. It's not a dilemma. You have to choose between two things. Here, it's actually a three things, and you can have at most two out of those three things. The three things are hyper-globalization, national sovereignty, and mass politics. And we have to pick uh, two out of the three. Uh, now, why is that so? I think probably the best way to understand the dilemma, the trilemma, is to sort of through a very quick historical tour uh, about the manner in which uh, sort of the trilemma uh, exhibited, exhibited itself uh, in different uh, periods of, of world history. Uh, first, the gold standard, which was you know the, the first real era of uh, um, uh, sort of high point of globalization in the late 19th century through the um, uh, first part, uh, through the uh, first decades of the 20th. Um, and essentially the gold standard model was one where uh, the, the world was organized uh, in, a, in a sort of in a divided way, different polities, um, and the requirements of the gold standard was that that capital had to be completely free to move. and domestic economic policy, there wasn't that much of a conception of you know, counter-cyclical policy or business uh, cycle policy at the time because there wasn't a conception of macroeconomic policy, but to the extent that there was domestic economic policy, certainly monetary policy, central banks had to subjugate everything they were doing to the requirements of maintaining a fixed parity to gold and to ensuring that there was complete free mobility of, of, um, of capital. So essentially there was no policy space, the only policy that was allowed uh, was the one that the gold standard uh, um, uh, uh, required. Now, uh, the, 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 you know, historically, this could really work only um, to the extent that economic policy making was significantly insulated uh, from uh, mass politics or sort of mobilized publics as you get uh, in a democratic regime. And indeed, once uh, the uh, labor markets became institutionalized through trade unions, uh, with the rise of the mass media, uh, with the rise of, uh, with the with the broadening of the franchise, uh, with the um, sort of uh, uh, parties of, of 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 the left, labor parties. Eventually, uh, the gold standard could not be sustained, and uh, the key turning point is 1931, when essentially when Britain, being forced uh, to make a choice between maintaining very tight credit policies, even though unemployment is very high uh, on the one hand, versus having to drop out of the uh, gold standard, essentially chooses the latter policy. And as actually Kevin showed you with that, with his, that famous chart, uh, getting out of gold in 1931 was a, was a boon because it could reflate the economy um, and, and, and generate uh, faster uh, employment growth. Um, there's a nice analogy that, that Tom Friedman uh, used in, his, in, in one of his books about what happens to politics in a gold standard system, that politics, the space for politics narrows to a choice between Coke and Pepsi, okay? No local flavors allowed because anything that um, uh, um, would entail greater difference in politics requires sort of economic management, sort of a conception of your own regulatory apparatus, your own sort of management that would necessarily conflict with the requirements of um, uh, having no impediments to uh, no transactions caused to the free flow of capital or goods and services. Now, um, the, after the Second World War, um, the Bretton Woods regime was constructed uh, by combining two other uh, vertices uh, of this trilemma. And, and, and clearly the, the, uh, the idea behind this was from Keynes, because Keynes, having lived uh, through the failure of the gold standard, had taken the lesson uh, that in the kind of modern societies, modern polities that existed with map mobilized mass publics, uh, with, with, um, with free franchise um, and de democracies, that it was going to be impossible uh, to, to have free flow of capital, um, a, a kind of hyper-globalized system uh, that would uh, rule out economic uh, management. 
Keynes, of course, was particularly uh, anxious to make sure that there was space for what we today call Keynesian policies of demand management. But the same, of course, went for the creation of the erection of the welfare state that uh, essentially needed to be insulated from a lot of hyper-globalization. Um, and the same went where the developing countries or the newly decolonizing countries uh, was involved in having the economic policy autonomy required to industrialize, to diversify their economies and pursue the kinds of trade and industrial policies that would protect infant industries and diversify these economies. And that's essentially um, uh, what happened in the first few decades after the Second World War. Um, that was very much a kind of globalization. It's not that the world economy wasn't globalized. In fact, tariffs came down. We had general agreements on tariffs and trade. Um, but uh, capital mobility remained significantly uh, uh, restricted. It's important to remember that Keynes said that for his system to work, for the Bretton Woods regime to work, it was going to be important to have uh, restrictions on capital mobility, not, as he said, as a temporary expedient, but as a permanent feature of the system, because he understood that economic management had to be protected from the whims of, 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 of capital, uh, capital markets. Um, and in trade, even though we had a significant amount of trade liberalization at the border with tariffs coming down under multilateral trade negotiations, quotas being removed, it was a very limited kind of trade liberalization, uh, so kept hyper-globalization at bay. Uh, agriculture and services were out. Developing countries essentially were left on their own. Um, and even in manufacturing, when certain sectors came under threat, as in with textiles and garment, immediately sort of special protective um, uh, um, uh, 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 measures and safeguards were instituted, for example, in, in, uh, in the form of the MFA, the multi-fiber arrangement. So that's essentially sort of the Bretton Woods com compromise in terms of this trilemma. Now, logically, of course, we could imagine uh, a different way of um, organizing ourselves around the trilemma and just say, why do we care so much about national sovereignty? Uh, why not uh, transnationalize our political system uh, to match our transnational, our international market, uh, um, international market? So we could imagine a system where, in fact, we match hyper-globalization with mass politics at the global level. And this is it's worth thinking about this possibility in the context, perhaps, of the European Union, which I'll come back to uh, in a second, because if this may not be a possibility for the world as a whole, perhaps within the context of the European Union, uh, it is a possibility. Now, um, I think uh, this is a stylized picture. Uh, that uh, I think sort of, you, you know, one way to think about it is, is, is a representation similar to the famous uh, open economy uh, macroeconomic trilemma uh, that open economy and macroeconomists know. Uh, it doesn't strictly hold, but it's a, it's a useful way to think about the constraints and the trade-offs that you face. And indeed, today, in all of these areas, whether it's in trade, in foreign investment, in foreign finance, in migration or labor flows, what we observe are things that remind us of this trilemma that, are, that, that, that pushes us to make decisions that either uh, will, uh, um, uh, will, will force us to hyper-globalize and therefore um, conform to rules or harmonize regulations uh, with uh, others, um, therefore leaving uh, many domestic groups, many domestic uh, constituents very unhappy about the result, or alternatively, the domestic constituents will have the upper hand and will, will ha end up in a situation that falls far short of hyper-globalization. In each one of these areas, sometimes we pick one, sometimes we pick the other, but very rarely are we doing this uh, in a self-conscious way, taking the, the trilemma fully into account. Now, I want to say just one word or a few words just in the context of this slide, just to uh, make clear what I mean about the tension between democracy and globalization. Uh, the implied, the, 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 the tension that's implied uh, by the uh, trilemma between globalization or an advanced form of globalization uh, and, and democracy doesn't, strictly speaking, arise purely from the fact that global rules constrain domestic policy space, that global rules, the requirement of integrating markets, limits the space uh, within which domestic economic management can operate. 
That on itself is not what undermines uh, democracy, because you can actually imagine a lot of situations where surrendering authority or delegating authority to an international agency or to international markets might actually improve the functioning of demo democracy. So that's in principle possible, because under the principle of democratic delegation, uh, uh, global rules can enhance performance of democracies by limiting the power of special interests. So that, for example, was the hope of multilateral international uh, trade liberalization, that is essentially that trade agreements as a way of reining in protectionist special interests. And here is, in principle, a way in which delegating powers to international organization or international set of rules, or taking international commitments in the service of globalization might actually enhance the performance of democratic deliberation uh, or democracies, even though it in entails constraints. The difference, of course, is that the point, of course, it doesn't have to be that way that not all forms of globalization will necessarily work in that nice way. And I think we need to distinguish, and I think this is extremely important, particularly for economists, because economists tend to think a lot about how globalization uh, can do the, the good kind of constraint, but don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about how globalization can uh, uh, end up with the bad kind of constraint. And good kind of constraint is when the global rules are explicitly designed to address genuine democratic failures, and those might arise from problems of commitment, time inconsistency, capture by special interests, and so forth. But then there are global rules uh, that actually work differently, that they're essentially uh, mechanisms through which other special interests are able to capture the agenda and work around uh, um, uh, domestic constituents um, and, and, and upset pre-existing social bargains or pre-existing social contracts uh, through international rules. Um, and I think um, uh, that, that a lot of what has happened in the context of hyper-globalization, the way that, for example, trade agreements have become more and more an expression of particular special interests, mostly in the United States, but also in Europe, pharmaceutical companies, investors, large multinational corporations, uh, financial institutions, and the kind of policies that they have pursued uh, in the context of trade deals, uh, increasingly have made trade agreements look more like the second kind rather than the first kind. So let me now turn with that in mind to uh, Europe. Um, obviously, e Europe, the e Union, was in this context a highly, a completely unprecedented uh, experiment uh, where there was a push for a single unified market while political authority remained vested in national units. Um, and by sort of the trilemma says that you can't really do this. Um, without sacrificing uh, democracy, that there is some, this is something that, that is um, highly uh, un, 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 unstable. Now, so the question is, is, you know, sort of, what were we implicitly thinking of? We meaning sort of those people, you know, sort of or Europeans who thought about uh, this being something that would be desirable. Now, I think there were, you know, sort of, you know, there were two schools of thought. Uh, which um, made this experiment sound like a, a feasible, sustainable, and desirable arrangement. Um, and one, which was, I think, probably uh, a view that was held mostly by conservative economists or, 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 or technocrats, was the view that essentially a view of the way that the economy was supposed to function that went all the way back to the 19th century gold, stand, gold standard um, uh, uh, version of the economy. So in that conception of the economy, uh, you know, the fact that you could no longer have Keynesian policy at the level of individual nation states uh, wasn't a problem, it, it wasn't a bug, it was a feature. Uh, so the idea was that we were going back to, the, uh, to um, a self-equilibrating market system and uh, you want to forget the Keynesian uh, perspective and to the extent that, in fact, the markets in practice uh, um, uh, misbehaved, in this perspective, it was actually due to too much government intervention in the first place. 
so any problems with government, with markets, could be then traced not to market failures or inherent market instabilities, inherent problems with markets, uh, but the fact that the government was doing something that was responsible for the markets to work, and then all you need to do is to get the government out. So, you know, financial crises were due to moral hazard, uh, that was due to government's, uh, you know, intervention and support. Uh, sort of unemployment was due to institutionalized labor markets and, 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 and labor standards that were there because of trade unions and the governments. Um, if there was low growth and um, uh, not enough innovation, it was due to high taxes and, and so on. Uh, so from this perspective, you know, if you believe that, that you know, there is a self-equilibrating market economy that actually doesn't need much government, then from that perspective, what the single market does is actually force the governments into their proper role. So it acts as a harness. So the kind of gold, golden straitjacket comes back, and now the straitjacket is a good thing, it's not a bad thing, because it's a return to a pre-Keynesian understanding of how the economy works. Uh, the second perspective uh, is uh, sort of this, you know, a very loose view that eventually, sort of, if you take the functionalist view on which the European Union really rested going all the way back to the European coal and steel community, that we first work out these arrangements and the political community common interests actually really developed uh, um, eventually later. So in, from this perspective, which probably a lot of centrist political um, uh, figures held, that there was a re recognition of institutional gaps uh, but the view that, that given a long enough time, the quasi-federal political institutions might develop in time, democracy would be transnationalized, we would have a European demos, um, that, that a sort of a single market, economic integration, would eventually be matched uh, by a social Europe uh, and, and increasing fiscal integration and, and um, a convergence and harmonization of, of not just economic regulations, uh, but also social models, uh, tax regimes, labor market arrangements, and so forth, to you know, fully complete the union, provide the full institutional architecture that would essentially uh, transnationalize these political institutions uh, uh, to the same extent that markets are. So in going to um, essentially uh, the, the kind of fiscal political union end of the trilemma uh, for, uh, for, for Europe. Um, uh, now, the fact that neither of those two perspectives, the golden straitjacket perspective or the eventual fiscal political union perspective could be articulated in public, right? Because the first one would, not, would have met, been met by opposition, and so would the second one, uh, because uh, this was much more of an elite perspective, should have told us something about the feasibility of this, but in any case, uh, the, uh, the eventual uh, Euro crisis, I think, brought th these issues uh, to a head. Um, so I think the, the, Europeans, the European version of the trilemma uh, is the one uh, that, that you see on this. I think you will already see with, with Brexit, uh, countries uh, sort of moving in a different direction. Um, I think uh, what the uh, trilemma uh, applied to the European setting uh, tells us uh, is that assuming that we do not want to uh, do away with democracy, uh, the way to stabilize the system in a long-term uh, sense is either to uh, integrate politically to match uh, the uh, economic integration or to bring the economic integration back to loosen uh, the economic uh, ties. Um, the problem, of course, with the, uh, the second scenario is that it's a very costly one, as the British uh, are now finding out. Uh, and no doubt others who were even more in integrated would find out. And the problem with the fiscal and political union is not particularly politically appealing strategy. Um, I think that in the immediate aftermath of the Euro crisis, there might have been a window of opinion, of, of opinion, window of, of, of um, um, uh, uh, opportunity, uh, if the uh, European political leadership were to use the crisis uh, as a way of uh, making the case that what the crisis was, uh, was a, um, uh, a sort of you know, making clear uh, that um, the union was incomplete and therefore there had to be a leap uh, into much greater fiscal and political integration uh, as well. Uh, instead, I think um, uh, the 
as desirable as that eventual path might be, I think the, the way that the crisis played out uh, in the European Union, and particularly um, uh, the, the line that Angela Merkel took, um, made uh, this much less likely, uh, because essentially the crisis was presented uh, as a morality play uh, to uh, the um, North European publics, uh, that this was really a conflict between uh, uh, profligate, lazy, um, uh, and, and mischievous uh, Greeks versus the, um, the, the, the honest, high-saving, and hard-working um, uh, Germans. Uh, so there was too much of it's their fault and not enough of what was, from an economic standpoint, uh, a much more compelling story, that this was actually a crisis of interdependence, uh, badly mismanaged, that if the Greeks overborrowed, the Germans and the French and the Dutch and all the other countries overlent. Uh, so this wasn't a case of simply one side uh, 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 misbehaving, so in, in, that this was a case of this was a collective fault. Uh, but because that line was not taken, I think uh, the kind of division in the, uh, within Europe uh, and the difficulty of constructing a Europe-wide political community, I think, were significantly magnified by the fact that the narrative uh, that was presented uh, to the European publics uh, was this kind of, of, of a divisive kind of a narrative. It was a, a morality tale rather than a tale of, 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 of interdependence that needed to be completed. Uh, I think the second, um, the second thing that uh, aggravated the cost of the crisis and I think uh, makes the eventual choices for the uh, European Union that much harder is, is an over-reliance on structural reforms uh, early in the reform process. Uh, this, is, this would take me a little bit too far in the kind of, of, of sort of the economics of reform, but very, um, um, very uh, quickly, um, the, the, the theory that, that supply-side reforms uh, can boost productivity, output, and employment, uh, which is generally true in normal times, is not a story that works very well uh, during times when demand is really depressed and these economies are in the midst of a crisis. Uh, so in, and in fact, these kinds of structural reforms, whether it's privatization, whether it's uh, um, loosening labor market regulations, can in fact backfire because when demand is lax and the government makes it easier for you to fire workers, that's what you will do. And the kind of you know, enterprises hiring more workers will have to wait until demand uh, picks up. And so you pay a lot of cost uh, um, early on in the process and you don't get the productivity and employment uh, benefits. And I think this significantly, the, the over-reliance on fiscal austerity in the context of this sort of structural reforms being the growth strategy uh, simply didn't, didn't work out. Um, so, um, the, the, the going back now uh, to, um, to, 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 to populism, um, it really interesting uh, question is why the populist reaction in Europe uh, took the form mostly of right-wing populism. Um, that, um, uh, you know, you can think of, you know, Podemos in Spain and Syriza in Greece are examples where uh, populism takes more of a left-wing form, but most of European populism is essentially um, of a, of a, of a right-wing form, it's a nativist, it exploits uh, ethno-nationalist or, 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 or sort of, uh, you know, cultural cleavages, uh, is directed against Muslims, against immigrants. Um, and that's not always the form that populism takes. So here the comparison with, with Latin America is where, in fact, in Latin America, populism has taken mostly a left-wing uh, kind of a, uh, a, a political uh, orientation where it's not sort of, you know, you know it's, it's not uh, built on, on uh, ethnic or, 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 or nationalistic cleavages, but much more built sort of directed just as the original populist movement in the United States was at the end of the 19th century, directed against the financial elite, uh, in, the, in the case of Latin America, directed against uh, Washington, the IMF, uh, and, and World Bank uh, for imposing certain kinds of, of, of policies. And I think to understand this, I, I find it helpful uh, to distinguish between um, the, the demand and the supply sides uh, of populism. Uh, if you think about many of the uh, 
uh, insecurities, anxieties, um, uh, sort of um, uh, inequalities, both economic, social, cognitive, and political, uh, that, that, that globalization has aggravated, uh, those create sort of a kind of a demand side of populism, that they create generalized economic anxiety, discontent, loss of legitimacy, uh, uh, um, concerns about fairness, uh, about sort of the economic rules. Uh, but they tend to come in some kind of coate, inchoate form that needs to be framed and they need to be um, hung around a particular kind of narrative. And I view the supply side of politics, that is the political leaders, political parties, as those who are actually providing the narrative. They're providing a story about what happened to you and why and who is responsible. Um, and, and very broadly speaking, we can think that supply side taking one of two kinds, that populist politicians can mobilize support when there is this kind of latent demand that's generated by these economic grievances. Uh, they can mobilize support by exploiting you know, one of two types of cleavages. Uh, one is one type of major cleavage is this kind of the ethno-national uh, or uh, cultural cleavage, which, which leads to a right wing kind of populism, uh, or an income or social class, more of a sort of a left-wing uh, kind of uh, populism. And I think the, the main hypothesis here I would advance is that, uh, you know, sort of the, the salience of one or the other kind of cleavage uh, provides one way of understanding uh, whether uh, you will have preponderance of right-wing or, or left-wing populists. So if you take the United States, for example, uh, which was hit both by a trade kind of a shock, creating a lot of income inequality, as well as the consequences of a financial crisis and a lot of concern about terrorism and immigration. You had both left-wing and right-wing populists at the same time. You had Bernie Sanders in the Democratic Party. You had Trump uh, in the Republican Party. In most other countries, um, it's been mostly one or the other. And in, in, Europe, in, in Latin America, uh, where the, the, uh, the globalization shocks were felt mainly in the form of foreign investors, uh, uh, um, economic programs, stabilization programs, or structural adjustment programs imposed by the World Bank and the IMF, uh, that essentially reflected itself in, in a kind of mostly left-wing kind of populism. And it's interesting that, that the two European countries where you have left-wing populist movements that I mentioned, Greece, and, um, and Spain are essentially in the same relationship to Brussels and the Troika uh, as Latin American countries are in relation to Washington or the IMF. Um, and so you have left-wing populism there, I think, for very much the same kind of reasons. But when, in other cases, and I think in a lot of countries in Europe, it was the, uh, the um, the, the, especially the presence of immigration and, and also increasingly refugees uh, provided a kind of very salient cleavage uh, that could be easily manipulated. So we compare uh, uh, France and Spain, for example, which uh, both countries have similar levels of immigration. Uh, but the nature of immigrants uh, in these two countries is very different. Uh, in France, uh, more than half or nearly half of the stock of immigrants are, uh, come from either predominantly Muslim countries or from sub-Saharan Africa. So these are immigrants who very definitely look different. They can be identified. It's a very explicit and observable cleavage. Whereas in Spain, the, the, uh, most of the immigrants actually come from Latin, other Latin American countries, uh, sharing the same cultural heritage, uh, same religion, speaking the same language, and so forth. And I think that's one reason um, that the, the, the sort of the relative absence of a, of a kind of a uh, anti-immigrant um, right-wing uh, movement in Spain compared to, compared to France. So um, I've said already that with respect to, uh, to uh, Europe's future, um, uh, I'm, 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 I'm drawn to the conclusion, which is, which is rather um, uh, pessimistic, uh, given uh, the, the um, difficulty of either path. Uh, nonetheless, the, 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 um, the, the view, the conclusion that uh, Europe needs either more political integration or less economic integration, um, that entails thinking in terms of 
a, a kind of, if you will, a multi-speed uh, union, uh, perhaps with a set of core countries commit, committed to deeper political integration and, uh, and a set of other countries with much greater economic autonomy. Um, and you'd have to say, or I'd have to say that, that as difficult as this seems, especially at a time when the Eurozone seems to be recovering, um, uh, I think a, a planned or strategic ret retreat here may be much better than a forced or ad hoc or a acrimonious one. Um, and I think obviously, again, the Brexit process is, is something that, that, that shows us that. Now with respect to uh, globalization at large, moving beyond uh, the European Union, uh, I think globalization, uh, you know, sort of when we're stepping back from hyperglobalization, uh, we need then to think about what kind of rules. Um, and I think the principle of fairness suggests that we should think about fairness both domestically and internationally. Um, I would say that the binding constraint for sort of a sustainable globalization and open global economy today uh, is not that countries aren't sufficiently open, it's that the, the, op the world economy has lost its legitimacy, that it doesn't have enough legitimacy, and so therefore we should try to relax, we should try to remove first and foremost that constraint, the lack of legitimacy. And I think one way to think about uh, sort of how to operationalize that is by thinking about how we can uh, uh, essentially trade uh, policy space uh, among countries rather than trading market access. So we, we move from a mindset of trade rules and trade regimes and exchanging market access uh, to think about trade rules as sort of being traffic rules for the world economy where we're exchanging policy space. And the, poli the, the, and the point of the policy space would be for develop, developed countries to reconstitute their domestic social contracts um, and for developing countries would be to essentially have the freedom to engage in the kind of economic restructuring policies that can diversify and speed up and, and sustain their growth. So for those two reasons, I think both sets of countries actually do need that kind of space and how and that cr creates a basis for uh, an exchange or a bargain between the two sets. So let me, let me just, just conclude with, um, again, sort of speculating uh, um, in terms of you know, the future um, where we're, we're likely uh, to go. I think there is sort of uh, the bad, the ugly, and the good, or the bad, the good, the ugly here. Um, I think the, the bad scenario would be basically sort of return to the interwar period, a 1930s style collapse um, in global economic cooperation, and a rise of hard right and hard left uh, regimes. I actually don't think, this was a question that was brought up earlier in the day, I don't think this is a very realistic scenario. It's a very, for a number of reasons. Um, first, because I think there's much more international cooperation today than there was back in the interwar period. We actually have international multilateral institutions that didn't exist. Second, there's, despite their weakening, there is much greater social protection today in the, all the advanced countries. There, we have the welfare states in place even though they have weakened. Uh, so you're not going to get the kind of, of uh, complete collapse and, and sort of rise of un and sustained unemployment as you had in the interwar period. And also the underlying political economy balance today in the advanced country still remains highly favorable to export-oriented interests. So you put those three things together and because I think very unlikely that we end up with the bad. I think the ugly is a likely scenario that I think uh, that if there is an inability to respond, if mainstream centrist political groups are unable to provide an adequate response, um, I think that we are likely to see creeping populism and increasing protectionism. Um, and that would gradually might erode, not just the world economy, but I think much more seriously and much more fatally, uh, sort of the, the kind of liberal democratic system uh, that was created after the Second World War. And that would be the biggest price to be paid for that. I think finally the good uh, is what I call a kind of a demo democratic rebalancing and rethinking of, of trade agreements and financial globalization in terms of this kind of a, of a balanced um, uh, um, uh, uh, sort of exchange of policy space with a much more balanced um, uh, representation of interests, much more labor, uh, much more civil society organizations to balance the overwhelming voice that uh, corporations and, and, and investors have had. Um, and focusing much more in terms of negotiations in areas where the gains are very large, uh, 
uh, compared to the areas as in today's TPP or TTIP, where in fact the economic gains are relatively uh, small. So let me just uh, stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danny, for a great lecture. So I'm sure there's lots of questions, so I'll throw the floor open to the audience. And we have had people following us on Twitter. Um, nope, we have no questions from Twitter. So um, while you're gathering your thoughts, let me just use the, abuse the privilege of the chair of the session and ask you, Danny, um, Imagine that political economy considerations go out of the window, and now you can act as the benevolent dictator of the textbook. How would you change exactly things like free trade agreements to rebalance globalization in concrete terms? Well, I, I would de definitely, I mean, there are in, in trade agreements today, we are not um, focusing on the areas where the largest economic gains are. So if you think about sort of where the big gains are, the, clearly the the unexploited frontier of economic globalization is actually labor mobility. That's where the biggest gains are. So if you tell me you don't have, you don't have any political constraints, I would completely drop everything on the agenda of something like TPP, and I would focus it on working out sort of a set of, of uh, temporary labor mobility schemes or labor visa schemes where the economic gains would be huge. Another area where there are large unexploited gains is, is an issue that has come up before, is international tax coordination to, uh, to, to eliminate, sort of the, to get rid of tax havens and also um, uh, uh, stop sort of the race to the bottom in corporate taxation. And I think there's international tax coordination is another area where there are large economic gains uh, to internalize the externalities of, 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 of tax coordination. So those are two big areas where, in fact, from a purely economic standpoint, the gains are huge. Um, we're not doing anything in either of those areas for very different political reasons. But if you told me that you know, sort of political constraints were not an issue, those would be the two areas to, to look at. And all the, everything else that we're working on in TPP, by the way, you know, pharmaceutical patents, um, uh, you know, investor state dispute settlement, those are largely first order redistributive. Um, and their efficiency gains um, are on the whole highly ambiguous and debatable. Very good, please. <clears throat> May I have a, two or three short comments? First, uh, I don't think uh, that the demise of gold standard can be ascribed to trilemma. <clears throat> I think one should not omit the First World War. <clears throat> and the fact that after the First World War, there was not return to the gold standard, but to gold exchange standard which was very heavily criticized by Jacques Reff, among other people. So this is the first comment. The second one, I think, uh, Danny, you are using the word democracy in a very special meaning. <laughs> Normally, we, de we define democracy following Schumpeter as open political competition, <clears throat> and not by Keynesian policies, because I have an impression that democracy, according to what you've been saying, is exist when there is much more scope for fiscal policies, etc. But this is a very peculiar notion of democracy. So if you use a normal notion of democracy, trilemma disappears. Unless you define democracy the Greek way, fiscal spending. But you have Swedish democracy, you have Swiss democracy, German democracy, etc. So I think one should not use uh, words in a special meaning. If they have a defined meaning. And the third comment is that I think data uh, show a different story about problems of Eurozone. I have investigated this. There's a lot of literature, empirical literature, which points out first original sin. Certain countries should have been admitted, should not have been admitted, like Greece and some other. And secondly, the major policy error was to keep a very low interest rates. Which, is partly, which was partly due to ECB policies. So there is an alternative story <laughs> than trilemma. So three things there. Um, let me just go over them quickly. 
gold standard, gold exchange standard. I think for for the purpose of this story I'm telling, it's a, it's not a relevant, it's not a useful distinction, because the question was whether Britain, let's say between 1925 and 1931, the period on which it went back to the gold standard or the gold exchange standard, um, is uh, was effectively by the rules of the game. Uh, committed to maintain a parity and free capital flows. In, in that sense, it, 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 it confronted um, the problem uh, by the late 20s and 1931 was you know, whether it was going to have the freedom to reflate its economy um, and that would have entailed getting out of the gold standard as changing the parity. Okay? Uh, let's not talk about uh, the gold standard, but talk about a fixed exchange rate system, which was critical for eliminating any kind of transaction cost to the free mobility of capital. So that's the sense in which that particular vision of, of globalization uh, essentially impinged on the ability of the government to manage the economy, and the sense in which uh, in a highly mobilized society as Britain was in, back in 1931, it became increasingly difficult for the Bank of England to maintain high interest rates and live the consequences in terms of a very high unemployment rate eventually essentially had to give had to had to give in um, the the um, the second issue was with respect to the democracy I think that's that's I'm, I'm glad you brought that up so I use democracy in a very uh, specific um, uh, sense which is not that you can simply run Keynesian policies I, I use it in the sense that whether the political system is, res is responsive to the wishes of the electorate. That is, the political system has the autonomy to, um, to engage in economic policies and institute regulations uh, that are in line with social preferences as reflected in the electoral system. So that's the sense in which I use democracy. So when, when that, that means that if the economy is in a crisis, it might require reflationary policy, but it's not the only dimension. It might be that if society wants a fair amount of redistribution, that's the, ex that's the revealed preference to election, that in fact it can maintain redistributive tax policies uh, and that that is not undercut, for example, by uh, the mobility of, of capital that, that, that makes it impossible for the government to maintain uh, those kinds of redistributive policies or for that matter an expensive, uh, an extensive welfare state. Um, so let me leave the question about the Eurozone aside so we can discuss it. Um, there's a question over here. Um, hi, um, I think in the whole day that I have been sitting here, I think I didn't hear one word which I think I personally feel was very connected, which is terrorism. Um, so I personally feel that when Bill Clinton was there, that was the really the high speed, high um, uh, level of, of globalization was happening. Uh, Bush comes, September 11 happens, and then the aftermath of wars and rise of radical Islam, London happening, Spain happening, Brussels happening, Paris happening, and then the politics of fear starts. So where do you think that we have given a very academic view of things happening, but what about the role of terrorism and rise of radical Islam into this whole picture? Well, I, I would simply say that those become sort of background fears that can be very easily manipulated by demagogues. I mean, from a, from a very real fact-based uh, basis, you know, that, you know, you know, I mean, more people are killed in the United States by, you know, sort of, you know, falling in their bathroom and hitting their heads than, you know, have been through Islamic terrorism. So, you know, it's, it's but it is, you know, a kind of a, a, an issue that uh, it's relatively easy uh, to manipulate people's fears, so it becomes a hook on which uh, if there is a dissatisfied public, if there is uh, a bu bunch of economic and other grievances, it becomes a convenient hook for, I think, for populists uh, and demagogues to, to, to mobilize. Um, I, I think you're right that, that, you know, that starting the story of, the, of US populism in some ways by in the, in, with the 1990s and, and, and Clinton, because um, I think in the 1990s, the United States could have gone uh, the European way, because in the 1990s, when you, when United States really became much more open to trade with low-income countries, uh, it could have erected much more safety nets, more social insurance, in the way that Europe had done in earlier decades, um, and instead it didn't do that. And I think that made 
trade, a much bigger political issue, free trade, much bigger political issue in the United States, and this issue has come up in our discussions today, that free trade per se in, the, in Europe is not a controversial issue. Uh, even the sort of right-wing populists, you know, they might have problems with the euro, they might have problems with immigrants, but free trade is not a big issue for them, and that's largely because I think Europe has dealt much better. Uh, and I think, then, again, something that has been said, I think the, most, the much more extensive social safety nets have really helped take the edge off of insecurities and anxieties associated with removal of tariffs and quotas. In the US, that didn't happen. And the TAA that was put in place never worked and so forth. So trade became a kind of festering issue. And then it becomes a lot easier for a demographic to come and say, look, you know, it's just, you know, it's the Mexicans or it's the Chinese and, 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 and to mobilize support on that basis. Very good. Kevin, please. Three quick ones. Firstly, I felt you skipped a little bit too quickly over the distinction between the single market and the Eurozone. Now, I mean, at the Eurozone level, we can see that there are constraints on government's ability to make their own choices on fiscal policy, and there are maybe issues of democratic deficits that arise. And we think about the Cyprus thing and so on. It was, it was scandalous and so forth. But really, does the single market involve problems with democracy? I mean, uh, freedom of movement, if you want to say that, I'm going to say to you back, it's only the Brits who have a problem with it. It's wildly popular in the rest of the uh, EU. So that's the first question. Is it not the euro rather than the single market that is potentially an issue here and that requires maybe a move to deeper governments? Secondly, it's not just Greece and Ireland are, are two peripheral countries that have both left-wing populists, so Syriza and Sinn Féin, and they both have lots of immigrants. I mean, in Greece, there's a hell of a lot of immigrants. So I'd like you to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. And thirdly, the 1930s also saw lots of populism in lots of countries. It was more often right-wing than left-wing also, equally ironically. And I wondered what you thought about that. Well, very quickly, I mean, on, on Greece, of course, you have, you have the rise of right-wing populism with the Golden Dawn associated particularly with the more recent influx. So Greece, you know traditionally has not had much immigration, but you know, the recent rise has been associated with Golden Dawn uh, becoming uh, uh, more, more powerful. Now, I would argue that, that even in the case of the, the single market, even without monetary unification, uh, you, face up many of the, you face many of the same issues because the question becomes single market requires an acquis communautaire. It then requires countries essentially agreeing on a common set of regulations on a whole lot of domains, including many other domains which have been left outside because there's too much difference in view across in, in different countries, but may er, you know, arise concerns with regard to social dumping, for example, as you know, arises in the case of in Polish workers coming to France, right? This is not an issue about, um, the, uh, about single money. It's an issue about whether you can have a real single market with you know, mobility of labor when labor standards or rules are you know, somewhat different uh, amongst different uh, parts of the union. So I think there is a, you know, I think a single market puts constraints on how different, how much difference you can have in rules with respect to labor standards, with respect to you know, with respect to all your regulations, um, and and also you know to your tax policies, you know the issue with, of course you know sort of can you really have very different um, tax rates on corporate taxation uh, in a single market, and the question about unfair competition. I think the, the U.S. is a good example to bear in mind because at the state level in the U.S. Uh, there are variations, so that's but when whenever those variations. They're always, you know, much smaller than you have anything else on a kind of a more global kind of a scale. So the single market you can have, as the U.S. example shows, with a certain amount of variation across different states or different parts. But there are constraints on how different the extent of that divergence before issues like social dumping or regulatory arbitrage really becomes a serious issue then that you have to deal with. So I would say those issues exist on also in the context of the single market. Please. Um, I would like to ask you about the euro. Uh, Kevin O'Rourke left it out. Doesn't it surprise you that the majority of the Greek population, a large majority, despite the huge crisis they had, opted for keeping control in Frankfurt rather than in Athens. And doesn't it surprise you that the moment Mrs. Le Pen mentioned getting out of the euro, she lost the election? 
Well, I'm, I'm, less, I'm less sure about the, the second thing, whether that's true. It's an interesting thought. But clearly the first is a statement of fact that, 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 that I, 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 I don't know. But I, I think the issue is that this is, I mean, we know as economists that the cost of that is going to be huge. Um, so for Greece, you know, even though, you know, Varoufakis had, you know, sort of had, had prepared all these secret plans for introducing a different currency and so forth, um, I think, you know, even in the depth of that, you know, as bad as that situation was in Greece, I think people sort of said, you know, it could be a lot worse that the cost of that, inc you know, huge uncertainty, the potential cost of moving into a situation where if you lose control of your new monetary system, you're into now hyperinflation on top. Um, so those are very, th that's very scary. So do I, you know, I don't know which way I would have voted. Um, and so that's, so this is very, very costly. Um, and um, so it's, it's from that standpoint, it's not terribly surprising that, that it, it, it went that way. So, so let's take two questions at a time as we're approaching the end of the session. So please. Yeah. I would like to join in. You said the moderate globalization or a fair globalization would be a major target. I would like to ask you, uh, how would you implement that? I mean, if I understand in one of your books, you said that um, a nation should have the right to quit from certain regulations, for example, WTO, maybe if there are certain regulations, and a particular nation is in a development phase where that is disadvantageous, so they should be able to quit, uh, as I understand that you're right. But could that be then a kind of a customized policy according to a nation and their development and couldn't be fair of a danger of a big abuse and for multilateral organization would simply collapse sooner or later. Over here, please. I'm not an economist, I'm sorry for what I will say. I'm just a simple lawyer, but I think that the case of Greece has not big importance in the whole economy because only 2% of the European economy is uh, the presenting of the Greek economy. And um, because we have, you have uh, good, done a very good uh, lecture, uh, you have given too much uh, 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 questions to us. And uh, to make a question in your lecture it would be uh, why uh, the Americans don't change uh, the way uh, of their democracy, for example, to have uh, a more democracy like in Switzerland, because Switzerland took the democracy from the Americans and from the French in 19th century, and now we live in 21st century, and we have defined democracy in nowadays. That means that American president, uh, uh, like Bush, for example, not to go uh, so quickly for a war like Iraq, because the Iraq war has done also the Syrian war and also the terrorism, like other friends have said here. And the whole economy after the Iraq war was really in very big problems, you know it better. Uh, I have read once an uh, article from Siglist. And um, what would be the world without the Iraq war? Because the globalization we speak about means also to see the rules of the United Nations. And it was no respect of the United Nations uh, rules. And the populism was uh, really uh, in full because the CIA has just said some uh, lies, and the populism in the politics comes with the lies. Like Hitler has said, Poland has attacked us and we make a war. So the war in, um, in Iraq, uh, I'm sorry for what I'm saying, I'm not an economist, I think it has a very big impact in the nowadays economies because the barrel was 50 francs and went to 150, for example, after the Iraq. Yeah, and I think we should give Danny a chance to actually reply, uh, and then we have to wrap things up. So take your pick. Well, thank you. I mean, the, the, from the second question, uh, if we were to talk about the, the failures of, of American politics and American foreign policy and military adventurism abroad, you know, we'd have to have another week. Uh, so, and, 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 and I wouldn't be the best person uh, as an economist to, to necessarily talk about it, but I think Iraq was a very big mistake, and I think, um, uh, and I think uh, U.S. democracy is in, is in deep, deep trouble. Uh, so I, I, there's a lot of issues there. Um, I think the other question with respect to 
you know, if we were to think of a uh, world trade regime with um, more opt-outs or more customized, where countries were more able to think about it as a version of a world trade organization that goes, if you will, back to a kind of a, plural, a, a pl pl plurilateral approach. Um, rather than the, the you know the sort of the single undertaking approach, so I think the big difference uh, in the world trade regime was with the creation with the Uruguay round and the creation of the World Trade Organization, where there was now, unlike previous uh, um, rounds, there was one document, and all countries had to uh, uh, agree to the whole text. Now I think. We see that since then, you know, there hasn't been much progress on multilateral trade negotiations, and a lot of that is because you can't get countries to agree on. And I think the issue of going back to much more a pluri plurilateral approach, where like-minded countries can integrate in a deeper way in certain areas where they feel they have a common interest, and want to do so, can do so, but without necessarily forcing all other countries to sign the same text. So I don't think that's a, that's a very bad model. And I think the, the lesson that I take from uh, the long history of trade liberalization through the 1990s is that giving countries more freedom and having a lot of opt-outs and escape valves in the system uh, somewhat paradoxically actually makes globalization work better because if you create enough room for countries to manage their economies well and prosper, as they did uh, in the decades immediately after the Second World War, those countries are much more likely to globalize and become sort of more open than countries that actually feel that they're being constrained, uh, where they feel that they're subject to agenda of particular special interest, albeit you know, sort of what I call the market access uh, protectionist as opposed to the, 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 um, the, the classic protectionist. And then you have this, you know, pressure boiling up and, and the opposition in terms of the populace and so forth. So it's a, it's in a way, it's a bit of a judgment call whether you say, you know, right now the bigger issue is that, you know, that we, haven't cr we, we don't have enough uh, safety valves in the system and we're constraining governments too much, and that's partly the reason why we're having this backlash, as opposed to saying that if you did that, it would be like a slippery slope, then you would end up uh, in, in total protection. So I'm very much in the first group. All right, so I'm afraid we'll have to end it here, even if we could have gone on for much longer. On behalf of the UBS Center, I would like to express my gratitude to our keynote speaker, Danny Roderick, for a great lecture, and to all the speakers that we had the pleasure to hear today. I want to thank you all for coming to today's event of the UBS Center, whether you came for the entire forum all day long or just for the Zurich Lecture of Economics and Society. Uh, we've had an intense day of exchanging ideas, uh, uh, listening to top specialists from different backgrounds, and I hope you found the event intellectually rewarding and stimulating. In case you were a little overwhelmed or you want to share some of the highlights with friends and family, there's good news. We have a YouTube channel, and in a day or so, we will actually share the videotaped event with all of you. And with that, I wish you a safe return and a good evening. Thank you.